Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells a fascinating story. It goes something like this. Once upon a time, there was a powerful judge who didn't care about justice. He didn't care about God or about people. And uh, unfortunately for everybody in this story, this horrible judge was the only hope for this vulnerable widow who was being oppressed and had no options but to go before this judge. And she'd go and she'd wait for hours in the courtroom and finally she would plead her case and it sounds something like, judge, I've got no other place to go. I don't have money. I don't have influence. I have no other options to fix this and I can't survive without you. Judge, you're powerful. Can you bring justice? And every day she went and every day the judge said the same thing. Nope, I don't care about people, I don't care about God, and he closed the door in her face. And every day, this widow came back with her same sad story, because she had nothing else she could possibly do. And every day, the judge said, nope, I still don't care. And then one day after this went on and on and on and on, the judge just got fed up. He got tired of hearing the same story over and over again. He said, look, I don't care. I don't care about God. I don't care about people. I don't care about justice, but I do care about my comfort and my time. And because she keeps wasting it, I'll give her whatever she wants. Of course, Jesus is telling this story to teach us something about people. The lesson is that people like us tend to give up way faster than this vulnerable widow, but the reality is we should keep on asking God for help. In fact, sometimes we're actually like the judge too, we're stubborn and we're selfish and we take a really, really long time to begin to change. Of course, Jesus, if you, if you look up the story later, if Jesus elaborates on God who is really powerful, but God, unlike the judge, loves justice and loves people. But Jesus' story ends with well, it's with, with a tough question. And, and, and you kind of ask, well, what God is asking, if God is so powerful, why do people like us give up on asking for help? It's a story that raises questions about, well, people and God. Like, uh, if we really believe God can make a difference, will we keep asking him? Or will we give up? It's also a story about people, like people, like this judge, people, people do change, but do we give up on them, or do we keep hoping? The Apostle Paul ends his letter to the Colossians by taking these questions and bringing them to real life. And before we talk about where he goes next, let me just review how we got there. In the book of Colossians, Jesus, or I'm sorry, Paul starts off by saying, Jesus is a big dude. Jesus created everything, he holds everything together, he has a plan for your life, and there's so much on that theme. Then the next logical step in that, in that the book is that because Jesus is a big deal, that should change people who follow him. We sang about this, right? There are things Jesus calls you to do, there are things God or Jesus calls you not to do, and there's this beautiful phrase, pregnant with new life, do everything, in the name of of Jesus. Uh, it, it kind of this idea that Jesus is such a big deal that we change. And the final step is, so we see that Jesus is big, we change. And the last step is we see, or, or we start influencing people around us. It's an important order. We see uh, our need to change. We see, we see the log in our own eye before the speck in other people's eyes. But we get there eventually. If you want to make the world a better place, eventually you come up to something that seems impossible. A task that makes you feel powerless. What he's going to talk about next is how to address other people's problems. Like people can be problems, right? Like some people are threatening, they're powerful, they're manipulative, they, they could hurt other people, and they do. This is a problem. Other people are powerful, they're well-resourced, and they could help others, and they don't. Uh, lots of people are being hurt. They're vulnerable, they're, they're in need of help, like this widow, and they don't have really any good options. 
Or there's a bunch of people that we all know who really make bad choices. They are victims of their own choices. There are people who are stuck in bad habits that they keep going back to over and over again. Or they're engaging in self destructive behavior. And, and you, like, just as a friend or relative or whatever, you watch people destroy another relationship with gossip or wreck another community by bullying others, or maybe they're just like, talking down to themselves too much, or maybe they're going into addictive behavior or they're overly dependent on things. And if you're like me, you watch people and you just want to grab them and go, look, can, can you stop it, right? So you're nodding because you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You may have even figured out names that you're thinking of, but I'll bet there are people you're thinking of who you wish could change, you don't know how to help them. Maybe you've tried it, maybe you've learned it the hard way that grabbing them and yelling at them isn't really gonna change them. The question is, what can you do to help influence people for the better? This is the question we're talking about. The Apostle Paul has just talked about how to follow Jesus in places where it's the hardest. Last week, if you were here, uh, what Colossians says is that where, how you act at home and at work matters. If you read the verses right before where we, where we are this week, the Apostle Paul has just talked about how important it is to be a good husband, wife, child, parent, employee, boss, like all, all the places where if you act like Jesus, you're going to come up against people who may be hard to work with. And here's a logical question you're going to ask next. What can I do? I'm a person in need of change, and I'm surrounded by people in need of change. Like, how do I make a difference? How do I go about doing what seems like the impossible task of helping broken people see how to live better, to, to be more kind, to be more just? Like, like where, where do I even begin to help people live in ways that are less self-destructive? If you're someone who's like watched Jesus change you, and you've seen yourself make progress, and you've seen yourself become more kind and more generous and caring, like sometimes you get, you can't help, you just get a heavy burden for people around you. What do you do to help people change? The Apostle Paul is about to tell the Colossian church the answer to that question, and we get to listen in. What do you do? When you don't think you can do anything, how do you make a bigger impact on the people around you? Are, are you ready? Here's what he says to you. This is Colossians chapter 4. I'm going to read verse 4. The Apostle Paul writes, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. This is, of course, the language and the lesson of Jesus' story of the persistent widow. What do you do? You, when you're up against a problem you're not powerful enough to fix, you ask someone who's powerful enough to fix it, and you keep asking. You know, my head's here just to the church calendar. If you read the story of Ascension Day, you know this is exactly what the first disciples did after the resurrection. Like, uh, Jesus ascends into heaven, you're in Acts 1, you read the next verse, and they all join together, it says, constantly in prayer. This whole uh, be watchful and thankful, the, the, impl the implication is that there is a persistence that is unrelenting. The word watchful in the New Testament usually means looking toward the unknown hour of the Lord's return, with, with in the back of your head, like, Jesus coming back the same way he ascended. And I think what Paul's doing right here is he wants to keep Christians from being surprised or unready. He is definitely warning people like us against giving up or being distracted or lazy. It's the same kind of language of Jesus' words to his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Stay here and watch, watch and pray, Jesus said, so that you will not fall into temptation. This is what Paul's saying here. Or if you remember, too, uh, Paul started the letter of Colossians talking about prayer. Let me just flip back and read it. This is how the letter starts, right? Uh, chapter 1, verse, I read 9 and 10. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually 
Ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that, excuse us, sir, he's praying constantly so that they might live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Can you see, can you see Paul's logic here? Here's a guy who is absolutely convinced that the act of praying, going to God, asking for him to change people, and, and he underlines this a couple times, if it is done continually without stopping, God uses that action to have the end result of, look at the end of the verse, people changing to have their lives live better. Like, Paul really believes this, because he's really seen it, and he says it in a couple different ways, let's not give up on praying for people. That's his experience. The Apostle Paul, I mean, think about Colossians, right? This is how Colossians starts. He hears about people who, well, assumably are not pleasing God, are not doing good things, who don't know about God. But you see what he does here? He prays for them. And it doesn't work. They don't change. So you know what he does next? And, and what he does sets him apart from most of us. Do you know what he does next when praying doesn't work? He keeps praying. He doesn't give up. He says, we have not stopped praying for you. Here's a guy who prays persistently. Because look, um, God doesn't answer my prayers instantaneously. Here's a fact. People are stubborn. We're a little crazy. And people don't change instantly. Like if Paul says, be really intentionally, pray that people will hear about God. You see what it says? And God ultimately changes people. See his language of fruit. Let me, let me hop back into Colossians 4. Though. Here's what it says next. Oh, by the way, um, pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in shame. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Now look, this might be a bit of a theological point, right? But um, you see what he's praying here? He, he's not just praying that he has courage or opportunities or the right words. Like, here is a prayer. God, there are closed doors. God, there are closed heart. There are people who don't want to hear about Jesus. There are people who find God offensive. And here's a prayer. God, yeah, give me the right words. Give me the opportunity. But, see what it says? Could you change people? Could you open a door? Could you change people who are closed off to the gospel? Could you open their hearts in a way that only you can to the gospel? And Paul, Paul prays this, right? And God doesn't do anything. So you know what Paul does next? He keeps on praying. And he asks other people to pray persistently and ultimately. God acts and changes people. Like, I, we need to hear this. I need to hear this. Like, if you have people in your life who need to change, who are completely closed off to thinking about the gospel, or repenting and changing, like, no matter where they are, right? They may be people who you live with, your family. They may be people really far away who you just read about or on the news. Like, or also, no matter what they're into, from self-destructive habits to putting people in danger. It's all the same. Do you know what you should do about those people? You should pray. And you see language, be alert, be watchful, be, uh, be a willing conversational station partner. But look, pray and don't give up. And it, it, it seems obvious, but I have to say this. But you know what most of us do? We think about people like that, and we might pray. That's easy. You know what we do next? We give up. Because nothing happened as soon as we prayed. Which, by the way, in Luke's story that Jesus tells, what most of us do when we pray we give up, Jesus defines as not having faith. What happens when we give up asking God for stuff. And I confess that is our default and natural reaction because we are impatient. We really want instant results. And I get it, right? I talk to lots of you, right? 
Lots of you know and are burdened by people who are in deep need of change. So you know what we all do? We'll pray, and nothing happens, so you know what we do next? Most of us just give up. And I am guilty of this myself. But let me, you know, let me say this. Sometimes, sometimes though, I, I don't see the normal. Sometimes I get to watch miracles. Last Sunday night, um, one of you were overjoyed. You told us about your granddaughter because she was in bondage to self, bondage to addiction for years. She was a slave to drugs. I think last Sunday we heard, after years and years and years, she decided she didn't want that anymore. And she started a really long rehab program, which, <laughs> that, is, that is a miracle, right? Or sometimes I'll, I'll hear people reflect about their own lives, and it sounds like, look, a year ago I was a different person. I looked different, I had trouble praying, I used to really be depressed, I used to beat myself up, I used to not have hope, I used to, I don't know, yell at my mom, yell at my kids when I couldn't deal with stuff. But now, like people, people like us change. It, it's, it's a miracle. Anytime stubborn people like me change, it is a miracle. Or, you know, this week I did lunch with a young guy, and uh, he had spent a, a decade uh, addicted to opioids. And I hadn't seen him in a couple years. He had been locked up for a while. And uh, I'll be honest, I was in a diner, and he walked in, and I didn't recognize the guy. He looked like a different person. In a couple weeks, he's celebrating four years clean, which is huge. And he seems completely changed. And uh, in my experience, this is not scientific, it's anecdotal. I'm around a bit, though I hear a lot of stories. In the back of my head, whenever I watch a drastic transformation story like this, I always, at least in the back of my head, I ask the question, were there people who were praying for this person? Or did people give up after the first week, month, year, or <clears throat> decade? And uh, again, not scientific, this is just me asking questions. Most of the time, when I ask that question, the answer is invariably. There is somebody, or there is a group of people who have never stopped praying for a miracle. Like for this granddaughter, people in our church who who didn't know her or really far away, I've been praying for years without giving up. For this former addict who I had lunch with, people in this room have been praying for this guy for his whole life. Uh, he looked at me from across the table and said, look, I, I do want to thank Ocean Church, and he said, for never giving up on me when maybe they could have or should have. Then he mentioned somebody by name who, like, he's like, I never wrote back, I never acknowledged it, I never thanked them, but Make sure to thank said Norma Eck and the Wyatt and Board. They sent me cards. They never gave up on me. They always prayed for me. That's huge, right? And, and let me say this. When, whenever I get to see someone who seems to have changed drastically, I have always also seen in the background people who are praying for this person over and over again. Moms, grandmas, whoever. Like, and there's people who've been prayed for for decades, for years and months. And, and as, as much as I love that, though, like praying changes things. Like it always raises the question for me. And, and I think about what, what about what about all the people we forgot about? What about all the kids, coworkers, parents that we just have long stopped praying for because their needs seem so big, they seem so stubborn. The ones that I hate to say it. What about all the people in need of change that we don't care enough to keep praying for? You know, people who we may pray for a day and we give up because we talk to them and these people are exactly the same. What about all the people that we give up on and maybe we shouldn't give up? And I think what God is telling us in really clear terms is this. Devote yourselves Prayer. Or I'll put it this way, talk to God about people. Talk to God about people. Because when you watch and pray, when you don't give up, God often chooses that time to do something. And that space, that tough space between praying and change is called faith. 
But there's more to it than that. Um, Paul says, don't just pray. Don't just talk to God about people. Here's what else Christians should do to change people. Here's the next verse. This is Colossians 4, uh, verse 5. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I'm not sure how to expand on this. It's pretty clear, right? If you're a Christian, God is calling you to think through how you act toward non-Christians. Why? Well, because they're watching you. They're judging you. They're evaluating you. Like, I think Paul's saying, don't be the reason why someone is closed off to Jesus. You, you know people like that, right? You'll hear people say, look, I, I think Jesus is a good idea, but my Christian neighbor, I don't know, dumped his leaves on my lawn or something, so I'm not going to read the Bible, right? You've heard people like that. If you're a Christian, your behavior matters. And how do you behave? It says, wisely. And that's all it says, because uh, life is complicated. It does say make the most of every opportunity. It's the sort of thing you have to keep your eyes open, because uh, life takes wisdom. But the fact of the matter is you deal every day with people who are watching you. And they're going to see and learn how followers of Christ act and react to life. You have the opportunity, that's the word it used, the opportunity to represent Christ. Will you take advantage of that? Or will you become someone's excuse to keep the door of their heart closed off to the gospel? And to be clear, it's not just how you act, right? You look at the verse behind me. Paul makes it explicit. He uses the word conversation, which involves talking, right? Your conversations, and this is hard and it can be awkward, but I think God wants us to be open in talking to others. How do you talk about well, a couple things he says? Your conversation should be full of grace. In other words, we should be gracious. We should be known as being civil and kind and empathetic. Also seasoned with salt, which, by the way, a salty language sort of means something else. He's not saying like, Use a lot of profanities or talk like a salad. Uh, seasoned with salt was used to refer to language that was memorable, sometimes funny, clever, uh, well thought out language is what uh, seasoned with salt means. In other words, Paul's saying, look, uh, be memorable, don't be boring. And if there's a lot of Christians who are boring. Uh, Paul says, don't be like that, be bold. And the third thing he says, which is harder, right? He says, know how to answer everyone. Assumably, everyone who challenged you who has, I don't know, questions. That's really hard, right? So someone is hard enough to take on the, the task of introducing Jesus and like staying long enough to answer questions is harder. Like, you, you know what the questions are, right? What about suffering? What about bad things happening to good people? What about injustice? What about, I think follow, part of following Jesus is being brave and confident enough to ask the question yourself, which is brave, and then to be bold enough to share the answers you find with other people who share those struggles. In, in short, I think that God is calling you to talk to people about God, to talk to people about God. And uh, for Paul, this is not by any means an academic exercise. You can, uh, I'm not gonna read this, but you can read the next several verses in Colossians, he literally names names. He gets into the weeds. He talks about real life, minutia. He, he, he literally names names and where people are at. People who he's praying for, people who, who he's working for, people who he's asking to be more like Jesus. And uh, if you Google the names, like you'll discover uh, some of these people fail miserably. But, but, but Paul's not content to go like, Talk to God about people, talk to people about God. And Paul like makes it real. And he makes a list, he names names, and it occurred to me that maybe we should do what Paul does. And I think, you know, as a preacher, it's 
it's really easy to present God's word as knowledge. I could just end, I could end the sermon right here, right? I could go, hear the sermon, talk to God about people, talk to people about God, listen, pray. But that's, that's not what Paul does. So it's not enough to know what to do. Sometimes you should, I don't know, actually do. So, so here's what we're going to do. Um, here's how we're going to end the study of Colossians. Instead of reading Paul's list of names, which you can, I'm not going to stop you. I want you to write your own list. If you have a pen or a pencil, use that. Uh, most of you, I think, have a, a handout. looks like this in the bulletin. If you don't have one, I'm going to ask maybe James and John in the back to, uh, if, if, you, if you need one, raise your hand. They'll figure out how to get it to you. But if you have one like this, fold it like this, and you'll find on one side, uh, well, a list. And the list is just for you. You can use a pen. You can just make a mental list in your head. Uh, it is designed to encourage you to not give up on people. The first set of blanks, well, it says, I need to talk to God about. And here's what I want you to do. Make a list. What are some names of people that you know, that you think about, who need a change? And you're really, really tempted to give up, but you shouldn't. You know who I mean, right? You know people who are stubborn, self-destructive, who need to have their lives turned around, right? And imagine if they could start telling their story in a year. Three years, and five years, and in a month, whatever. Imagine there's a day when you get to hear them say, I used to be like this, but now I've changed. Now I'm more, and I don't understand how I got there. Imagine if that could happen. It would only happen by people like you praying for them and not giving up. And, and their journey to change might start with you writing their name on this list and remembering to pray, going, God, you're really powerful. Could you change their heart? And you may have to keep this name on your list for years, but I think you should. Pray for people by name. Don't give up. I'm going to give you a couple seconds. Spend that time thinking about people to talk to God about. Seriously, write them down, make a mental note, whatever. But remember these folks. I'll give you a couple seconds. Everybody thinking of some names, right? Look at the names on your paper. Think about the names going through your head. Here's what I can tell you for sure. This is what God is asking you. Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful, faithful, and don't give up. And let's see what God can do. There's another side of this paper too, right? Because there are people who are watching you and listening to you, who have questions, who are looking for answers, who are in need of change, and God might use you to talk to them. So here's a list. Who might God use you to talk to? And write down some names. Think about it. This is a hard one. Think about some opportunities you may have overlooked to have conversations with. Who, and this is like a big, bold, scary ask, who might God be asking you talk to God about. Think about some names. I'll give you a few seconds. You know, we could take more time with this, but I'll bet by now most of you are thinking about at least one person. Look at the names. Think about whoever you're thinking about. Here's what God is telling you to do. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know what to do. This is, this right there, this is God's plan for you, 
starting to change people. And I, I'm not exaggerating here. This is how the world changes one person at a time. Here's the big question. Are you willing to do this? Are you willing to do the work that might be hard, it might be awkward, it, 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 you might feel like this persistent widow to keep asking and not give up. But I, I think this right here is what God is calling each of us to do. I, I'll, I'll add one more thing, and uh, this might be unnecessary, but if the green section is terrifying for you, I get it. Talking to people about God is difficult. They, uh, answering questions about God is difficult. I, I, I just... I want to make it really easy for you, and maybe the easiest thing for you to do is to invite folks to church. And we work really hard at making our services accessible to non-Christians, and uh, we spend the, most of the service uh, literally answering things about God, so that's, that's helpful if that's hard, tricky for you. And uh, we're going to start next week going back to some of the really basic parts of the gospel, which I love, because I think I get hit by something different every time I think about what Jesus did for us. but. If you're looking for an easy, gracious way of well, talking to the names on your list about God, giving answers, here, here's the deal I would make. If you invite folks to church, I will do my best to well, talk to them about God. It's not too hard to invite folks to church. You can say something like, uh, join me at church, and I usually try and invite you to lunch afterwards. It's, it's a good time. Um, but if you do that, I'll do my best to help answer questions about God. So. Everyone, everyone's seeing feel what God's asking us to do. We've got some work ahead of us. Let's ask our shepherd to help. So Father in heaven, could you lead us like a shepherd leads sheep? Father, like sheep, we need you more than we often realize. And can you help us when we go through the ups and downs of life to find in you all we need to, 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 to succeed, to live, do what we need to do. And can you help us as we discover the riches in your gospel to share with others around us? Can you give us the faith to keep on keeping on, to keep on praying when we are impatient, to keep on hoping when we've been disappointed so many times? And can you give us the courage to represent you in our actions, in our ethics, in our care for others around us, and even in the words that we speak. Can you help us to be more like your son? Can you give us the sort of love that you, our loving shepherd, has shown us? Can you help us to follow you? We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.